What's up guys, Migs here and I'm with Brian Baker? You bet. Brian, thank you so much Absolutely for spending time with us today. Of course. Great to Appreciate see you. it. It's good to see you again. We've been hanging out now since our last great food and wine event when we first met years ago. Years ago over at Disney World. Wow. Epcot. Fantastic. Beast of the senses. I have so many things to talk with you about today. Let's get right to it. Absolutely. How long have you been working, I guess, in the wine business? Started in the wine business in 2004. I was fortunate enough to be the first um, vice president of CRM okay. for Jess Jackson at the Kendall Jackson, fam Jackson Family Wines. Wow. When CRM was a brand new concept, which we now call Wine DTC. Um, they are different, but they are, it's the same idea. It's selling wine direct to consumer. Sure. And that's where I started my career, and I got that job because I was at an interview. I was at a, a sales call with a guy named Martin Johnson, very famous guy in the wine biz. And uh, I finished the sales call, and he was telling me the whole time in this sales call that the program I was trying to sell, a co-op program, would be really good for the new VP of CRM that they were trying to hire. And they said, we have these huge problems. He said, all the Amex people, and he literally said, all the Amex people who are data geeks know nothing about wine. All the wine people who are really good at wine know nothing about data. Because right. nobody knew about big data in those days. Nobody was even thinking about it. And I left with my uh, rep, and we went out, and I turned to her and I said, I want to go back in. And I turned to the receptionist and said, can you please buzz me back in? I forgot something in his office. And she goes, oh. And I said, and Judy goes, what? I said, trust me. I walked back in and I said to him, Martin, I want this job. And his words, famous words to me were, no, you don't. I said, no, I'm dead serious. I want this job. He goes, are you serious? And I said, I'm very serious. He goes, have lunch with me in two days. We'll talk about it. Wow. And that's how I started in the wine business. I had been in the travel industry little ad agency business in the middle that was selling the co-op program okay and that was my transition and from there i was fortunate enough to jump over to montalena right then jump over to my right then jump over to heston vineyards yes. um and now i'm in a very different business i'm in the rum business i have a distillery in belize i feel I like this for. i feel like this is going to cost me money okay good <laughs> i have a distillery in belize that i'm a, a part of okay. and we sell a hundred percent organic rum made out of sugar cane agricole style and it's uh, an incredibly green product that's very tasty so being friends with brian can get very expensive because he's a great <laughs> salesman so the first year that we went to see chateau montalena we became wine members became wine, wine club you were members very good wine club members and, and then I appreciate that and then always. we went to my accountants and then you went to my accountants you went and we were gonna we were gonna join yeah. the wine club and we we're like Ah, we got so much wine now yeah, from every yeah. all the other clubs. Yeah. I said, we'll just buy one. So the one that I liked, of course, was the most expensive bottle. It was the it was the uh, the model. It was the Maya Comis, It was the Maya Comis Cabernet. Right. And she yeah. said, I don't even think we have any. Let yeah. me go check. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, so. the, interesting story. Maya Comis was also in the Paris tasting. They finished in the, in the mids. Okay. They were gotcha. in the middle. Gotcha. But Bob Travers was an amazing winemaker, and. Uh, my commerce was a great property up on Mount Beater. So. Well, the last company you worked for I ended up buying frying pans for the house. Well, yeah, Meyer Corporation. They were really good. Meyer Corporation, pretty well known for their ending in N-O-N pans yeah. like Anilon. Yeah. I'm going to do a Bottle Shock showdown. Okay. They always called Bottle Shock a love story to the wine industry. It was fanciful in some ways there were some made-up characters as i said rachel the the love interest was made up but it told a wonderful tale of david and goliath and it got people interested in yeah. wine yeah. now remember prior to this there had been some really downer movies and i i love sideways i don't want to mm -hmm. diss sideways but sideways had a lot of sadness in it i mean it was a couple of alcoholics and dysfunctional marriages and some very sad people that yeah. you know a at lot the end more the drama day, than a comedy lot more drama right yeah. um mondo vino which was a yawn which took like two and a half hours to get through people were like what is going on suddenly this wonderful campy comedy comes along right. with actors people recognize right and of course an actor who would become very recognizable yeah. 
in Chris Pine. Bottle Shock is a 2000 and do you know what year? 2009. <laughs> comedy drama yes okay based off of what event the paris tasting <laughs> took place in 1976 at the intercontinental hotel on the second floor on the balcony hosted by stephen spurrier and organized originally by patricia gallagher who worked for Steven at the time. Who played Steven Spurrier in Bottle Shock? Oh, Steven Spurrier was played by one of my absolute favorite actors of all time, Hans Gruber. Hans Gruber. I'm going to count to three. There will not be a four. I think this is a stalling technique. Do you remember the actor's name? Absolutely, I remember his name. I actually have to, I always, this no. is the one actor I forget. I'll tell you what, tell me, who who did Chris Pine play in the movie? Well, Chris Pine played Bo Barrett. Okay. And, and Chris Pine was a very interesting story in that movie because he is the son of yes. a very famous character actor. Yes. John Pine. Okay. Who played in the TV series Chips. In the 80s, if Chips, the original motorcycle. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Who's this? He was their sergeant. Oh. He's the guy that kept getting in their in their face, right? I didn't know that. Now he told his son Chris, because Chris had grown up in, in in Hollywood. He grew up in 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 the valley, and he said to him, "Daddy, I want to be an actor. I want to be an actor." His dad says, "You can be an actor only if you do two things. Number one, you have to go to college. You have to get a degree in something real." Can't be theater arts, has to be accounting, has to be economics, has to be something that you can use. Second, okay. if you can make a living for three years in the business I've been in for 45 years, and at the end of three years you are completely self-sustaining, I will let you pursue that career. Wow. Chris Pine is on the set of Bottle Shock. He's done a couple of small independent things. It's been two years and ten and a half months. And this story, Chris told me this story directly. Okay. Two years, ten and a half months, and he's on the set shooting around August 2009, not too far from here, up in Kenwood. And he gets the phone call from his agent who says, I have some very good news for you. You are the new Captain Kirk in the Star Trek reboot. Wow. His first call was to his dad, and he said, I think I made my three-year deadline. Holy cow. Yeah, that is a big jump from Bottle Shock. Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman. <laughs> sorry. Alan sorry. Rickman. Alan Rickman, one of my favorite actors. Yes. Who also doesn't like, sorry, passed away, late Alan Rickman, didn't like white wine. So Linda and I, when we were at the event that we did at Montalana, where we had the actors come in, we yes. convinced him to try some white wine. He said, oh, it's got sulfites, you're allergic. He really loved the Chateau Montalana Riesling. Okay. Um, and he was a big fan also of the red wines. He and his wife, and this is something I've always respected about Alan, original wife. The wife, the woman he married years before, before he became famous. Okay. And they were foodies. Yeah. They lived six months a year in England and six months a year at their place in Tuscany. Wow. And they were very, very into the foodie lifestyle. Always loved that about, about him. Who played Bo Barrett? Chris Pine. Who played his dad? His dad was played by Bill Pullman. Now, Bill ah. Pullman is a very interesting guy because many people remember Bill as the president in Independence Day. Okay. Right? Yes. Now, Bill Pullman, I was doing a tasting for the cast in the green room, and everybody was really getting into it, and Chris Pine was very into it because he'd grown up around wine, and uh, Freddie Rodriguez was there, okay. and he'd grown up in a house that had a lot of wine. Um, Rachel, I'm, I'm, I'm going to blank on her last name. She played the love interest that was made up in the yep. movie. Okay. They were all going into. She's from. Um, she's originally from uh, from um, um, Australia. Okay. Bill Pullman is drinking and tasting, and at point in time, he looks at me and he says, "He goes, listen, I'm really sorry, but 
I gotta be honest with you, I can't smell or taste anything. And I felt so sorry for him because this is someone that couldn't enjoy food and wine, but right. great actor. And right. he was, he was both, he played Jim Barrett, yeah. who was, you know, punching his son in the fake boxing scene. Where did that get filmed? That was filmed on the Cunday Estate up at the Ghost Winery off of Highway 12. Um, that's where the tasting was also shown. They had that at the Ghost Winery. It was actually at the Paris Intercontinental Hotel. That was my next or question. Balcony, um, on the balcony. And in that tasting, there was another interesting thing that happened. There was only one American there. That was George Tabor, who covered the event and wrote the famous 265 word article that appeared in Time Magazine. Um, the issue that Time Magazine published it in was the issue that had a very famous cover and it was covering the West Point cadet cheating scandal and had a picture of a cadet on the cover with his fingers crossed behind his back. <laughs> June, I think it was a June 19th issue, 1976. And the other person that was at that event who has never talked about is a, is a gentleman named Jean-Pierre, and I think it was Valjean. He was the restaurant manager. Okay. Now, the restaurant manager and the food and beverage director at this restaurant that was in the Paris Intercontinental Hotel yes. were not invited to this event. Oh. Now, in this pillared ballroom, and they're on the balcony, remember, they were able to sneak in and watch the event. They couldn't hear, right. but they could see. Yeah. And he told me, Jean-Pierre Jean -Paul, Jean told me, at an event that I did for them with Chateau Montalena years later in, in Illinois, everything they read in the book, they could see those expressions. They saw that stuff happen, right. married, and uh, I want my ballot back. Right. When um, the, the French judge asked him, Spurrier, I want my ballots back. Right. And he said, Madam, um, you are a guest. These are my ballots they will remain with me. He watched and his friend watched the whole thing because they were kind of miffed that they had not been invited to the event because right, right. they were kind of the food and beverage guys there, right? right? Right, right. Yeah. So all in all, it was the event that shook the wine world. It was the event that, that taught not just California wineries, but wineries all over the world, Argentina and Chile and Australia and Missouri and Texas, every place that made wine that the French don't have this magic secret sauce right. that anybody can make wine and that was the seminal impact of the Paris tasting because wine consumption in the world increased from May 24th, 1976, right. after it was published in June, wine consumption had a steady, steady climb for four decades. How did it just break so big? I get Time Magazine, but... the George Tabor always explained it, that it would have been a non-event yeah. if California hadn't won the red tasting. Mm. Now remember, after the white tasting, when the white tasting was going on, all of the judges, including Sophie, the famous judge that asked for her ballot back, were taking it very lighthearted because it was like, oh, you know, we're just, it's our wines against, what, what is this place called again? Calawat, right. Calawat, right. where is it? It's in the sticks. Yeah. They weren't taking it seriously. Results are announced, Montalana wins. Yeah. And all of a sudden, and Jean-Pierre confirmed this, and Tabor said, everybody got quiet when the reds came out. <laughs> really, really quiet. Oh, that's the serious and stuff. And got serious. Yeah. And then when the Reds were announced as the winner, as Tabor has told this story many times, this would not have been published if they had not won, the, if the Californians had not won the Reds with Stag's Leap. Right. Um, so again, the, the section that it published in, in Time Magazine was a four-page uh, special advertising supplement right. that was anchored by a um, tire company who had a couple of famous actors in it. Well, uh, tire companies are known for their foodiness, aren't yeah. they? Yes, of course they are. You know, it's all that rubber, right? Vulcanized rubber. <laughs> the main article in this section, which is so funny, was about a new amusement park which had opened in Florida that was saluting Sid and Marty Croft. Okay. Right? <laughs> It closed within a couple of years. There were a couple of other ads in it, and this filler, as George called it, was literally pasted in to two different columns to fill space between the ads. And it turned out to be one of the most significant articles in the history of the wine world yeah. published in Time Magazine.
Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Brian, I have to ask you this question. When we're talking about the Paris tasting, we're talking about Chateau Montalena for Chardonnay, and then we're talking about Stag's Leap for the Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, is Stag's Leap wine cellars, is that the Stag's Leap that we're talking about? So Stag's Leap wine cellars is the winner of the Paris tasting. Okay. But there is also a Stag's Leap winery. Okay. And they call it the Battle of the Apostrophes because yes. it was a famous trademark. Uh, one was very old, been around since the 1880s. One was founded by Warren Winarski in 1972, the famous class of 72. And, and that's when you look at the labels, the apostrophe moves from before the S to after the S. But yes, that is the great, that is the famous uh, who won the red, which really is the reason that there was even an article published at time, as George Tabor said, no red winner, there's no news here when a white wine beats the French right. in white wine contest. Right. Because the money's in the red. The money's in the red. And that's right. what everybody was after. Yes. What is it like drive for show, putt for dough? Ex drive for show, putt for dough. Exactly right. Okay. Exactly right. Interesting. Now let's ask you a car question. Favorite car, favorite drive, favorite song. Paint us the picture. Driving from Los Angeles to Las Vegas on Highway 15 years ago when it wasn't bumper to bumper. 1985 Mustang, five liter, white on white on white convertible. Top Gun. Okay. Is on the tape deck. On the tape deck? On the tape deck. Nice. And they are playing the theme song. Okay. That was an amazing moment. I still get chills when I think about it. I can picture that. I'm kind of excited. So you're, are you driving to Vegas We're driving or to, to LA? Vegas. I'm the passenger. Okay, from LA. From LA. Okay, okay. And Wait. we decide to see if we can go past the TAC. The TAC oh, is at oh, Los oh, Angeles to oh, Vegas. Wait, 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 wait. You're the passenger? I'm the passenger because my wife of 30 years, Linda, is driving the car because it's her car. I never got the, this is this is different. We decide <laughs> that we are going to go because Danger Zone is cranking volume. Yeah. I have a watch and I've got my stopwatch on and I'm looking at the mile markers. I said, let's see how fast it can go. Because if you remember the 85 Mustang, that it tacked out at 85 miles an hour. Wait, 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 wait. Brian, I was asking you a scenario. Are you saying this happened? This really happened, yeah. This oh. really happened. This was one of my most, this is still one of my favorite moments that I would love to recreate. I would awesome. love to recreate this moment. And we were driving and we said, let's see how fast we can go. And by the time I did the math in my head, we clocked it at 112 miles an hour. And then it got a little shimmy. And Linda <laughs> said, I think we better back off. So we backed off to 90. No, nice. that was, that was, that was, that had, every, had everything there. It had desert, yeah. it had Top Gun, yeah. and it had this convertible that was gliding, just gliding down the road. How many years ago was this? 33 years ago, okay. at least. 33 so years ago. So it wasn't anything recent. Do not send him any kind of no. tickets. No, no. It was, it was, a, it was a fantastic moment. That, that is, that is a moment that I will always remember and wish I could recreate. That would be my, one of my favorite ideas. We know that weather plays a big role in wine. Mm -hmm. Certain vintages mm -hmm. are better because of yeah. not yeah. enough rain, too much rain, etc., etc. Et right. Frost, hail. So, based off of all the information that you have from all the different wine regions, from you know, France or up here, your yeah. specialty. Based off of that, is there a specific? It, it doesn't have to be a brand, but it could be an area within Napa Sonoma area with a specific year and why? I'm a big fan of acid okay. in wines. I think wines need to have acid to pair with food. So I'm a big fan of colder vintages. Okay. So in Napa Valley, the cooler vintages that we have had in the last few years. You're talking about reds. I'm talking about red and white. Both red and white okay. benefit from acid. Okay. So, you, so thinking about vintages like the 11, the eight, uh, 2002, um, 1998 was wet and rainy and cold. Those are vintages that were dissed by the wine press hmm. that if you can find them, particularly the 2008s and the 2011s, buy as many as you can because they are 10 year ones and they will, and they, I've tasted my 11s, yes. had my 8s, had my obviously 02s, 
they will mature and they will be magnificent. They are different from the big giant, what we called um, Goldilocks vintages, like okay. 97 right. and 07. Um, those were vintages that were ripe and it was very warm and the wines were very fruit forward. But, but as you're naming those specific years, is there a specific area for those years? Because sometimes, I, I don't well, know, that, I'm that in would, Sonoma that would, versus that would, Napa. That would, that would be Napa, right? Okay. So in Sonoma, the, I mean, the terroir is so different between the mountain range because yeah. you've, got the, you've got the Mayacamas Mountains between us right. in Sonoma Valley and Napa Valley. Right. Any, vin, any year in any, vint, any yes. wine region around the world that okay. has a cool vintage yes. has higher acid. Okay. And that is a vintage that I would collect because it will last a long time. But you have to wait. You have to be patient. Brian, thank you again oh, Max, for spending time. It was great time. to see you. Appreciate it. It really was. And um, we're going to do this again maybe next year. Maybe you're going to come to a car show with me. Girl. I would love to come to a car show because I want to go fast, Migs. Well, not only that, but wine. You know, like we said, luxury item. Which Absolutely. all within the same circle. All so. paired. All right. The Good. circle of life, brother. Well, until next time, we'll see you on Migs TV. TV. Alan Rickman.